So this is going to be Golden Doves, the introduction, class number 32, page 28, Roman numeral 28, the bottom of the page. Okay, so we're continuing, unlike the book in Western tradition, oh no, we read that, because, because. it's the very bottom of the page. Because rabbinic tradition did not recognize the inaugural uh, philosophy rhetoric split, which was in the Greeks, and insisted upon applying to the text categories that were excluded from traditional Western literary analysis. It could not be grasped in terms of the hierarchical oppositions peculiar to Western thinking. Right, so what we applied to the text were categories that they were not aware of. For example, we have derashot, we have uh, remez, uh, we have sod, right? So we have certain categories, and these categories are not at all aligned with the uh, traditional Western literary analysis. This situation now is changing rapidly. It's now changing rapidly. In, in the West, not in Amisel, <laughs> right. Um, contemporary critical theory is now challenging many of the premises and categories separating Western from rabbinic literary theory. So this is actually explaining why he wrote this book or what the strategy of this book is. The strategy of this book or the possibility of this book is because West, uh, Western contemporary literary theory, it's becoming closer to and more aligned with rabbinic literary theory. And therefore there's a bridge through which the two systems can somehow uh, communicate with each other, if I may. Structural and post-structural criticism no longer recognizes the traditional disciplinary boundaries, right? So one of the things that Jacques Derrida did and the other post-structuralists is they, they got rid of the Western hierarchies. Um, unfortunately, they used that and they applied that uh, to try to socially re-engineer, uh, to re-engineer society uh, and leading to Marxism and other things, but we don't, we don't uh, need that. We're interested in their literary uh, theories, right? Um, so linguistics, psychology, anthropology, etc. These are all different disciplinary boundaries, and everybody has to stay within their boundary. So if you're if you're um, uh, an anthropologist, you do not deal with literature. If you deal with literature, you do not deal with psychology, right? The boundary, as opposed to the Torah, which is an es hayim, which integrates all of these things. Interdisciplinary. Hello, continue. Um, the boundaries between critical theory and philosophy are no longer clear. To be more precise, critical theory seems to include philosophy, and in many quarters, it is actually displacing the educational and intellectual activities traditionally associated with philosophy. Right, which is much right. closer to Judaism, because by us, the idea of philosophy would be more, um, you know, we're interested in what the text has to say. We're not interested in abstract ideas. Right. This change has resulted in a common ground sufficient to permit exploring some of the fundamental principles underlying rabbinic interpretive and literary theory in, temp in terms of contemporary critical analysis. Right. So now we can compare the two. We can compare rabbinic uh, textual um, theory to contemporary critical analysis. Now we can actually, there's a, there's a frame of, there's, I'm sorry, there's a common boundary through which we can make a comparison. Yes. Although dealing with a central issue, the tension between ideality and articulation and conceptually interrelated, each of the five chapters of this work stands on its own and may be read separately. Interesting. Um, there's only one problem, I believe. He does, he, he, in the Hakdama, he gets into the first chapter, the second chapter, the third chapter, the fourth, and he does not speak about the fifth. Okay, that's interesting. I don't know why. Okay. That's a good well, point. Okay. Ah, because the fifth, ah, I know why. Because the fifth is the sikum of all, the meshing together of all four, first four chapters. The fifth chapter is called Golden Dots with Silver Dots. That's the uh, conclusion. That makes um, sense. Second, right. Um, also, depending on the intellectual background, of, sorry, one second. Although, all right, and can, each of the five chapters of the work stands on its own, maybe read separately also. Depending on the intellectual background of the reader, these chapters may be read in different sequence. For the modern reader, concerned with critical theory, the first and second chapters may, be, may serve as an introduction to, sub, to the subtleties of the Jewish ideality. For the reader involved with rabbinic literature, the starting point should be the fourth and fifth chapters. The third chapter will introduce the medievalist, or one who thinks in terms of medieval categories, to the peculiarities of classical Jewish thought. 
then, depending on his intellectual inclination, the reader may proceed to penetrate either the field of Jewish textuality or that field of Jewish ideality. Right. So basically, here he's giving you a guide to reading the book. And it's yeah. true, the fourth and fifth chapter, from the perspective of a rabbinic student, are really the easiest chapters in the sense that it deals very um, directly with rabbinic literature and rabbinic categories. So you start there, and then you go to the uh, Western categories dealt with in the other parts of the book. Um, <clears throat> right, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, interesting, it says the third chapter introduces the medievalist. Wow, interesting. That's very interesting. And by the way, the third chapter is the most difficult chapter of the book. It really is. Which, um, what is it, freedom, language, it. and negativity? Yeah, because one who thinks in terms of medieval categories, and that's probably why it's so difficult. <laughs> Um, obviously, as the attentive reader already knows, different arrangements will bear upon the perspective and the perception of the issue at hand. Therefore, some may want to pursue more than one course of reading. You know, you could, you could interchange. The first time you read it, you read it ala said The second time you read third, fourth, then the beginning. And they could do that different, uh, this. <laughs> Finally, in spite of numerous references to and analysis of Talmudic passages, we refrain from examining the Talmud as an independent topic. Right. The Talmud, circa 499 which was the traditional earmark of rabbinic elitist thought and ideality is currently the least known of all Jewish subjects. Right. Interesting. And it's the least known, but in many cases and places, it's considered the most studied. I think that in itself is an interesting fact to point out. The fact that people always, engage, meaning your, your common Jew, you know, I'll, I'll call it a regular religious Jew, it gives Talmud, the study of Talmud, the highest um, amount of time out of the Jewish studies. Yeah. The problem is the way they study, how they study, what they study, the methodology is very, very undeveloped, underdeveloped. And right, therefore, the Peshat, the reason, the Peshat yeah. was, he was talking about the Goyim, meaning oh, and the, the, academic the world. Talmud for the Goyim is Sefer Anistad because they have no idea they can't understand the Talmud because the Talmud really deals with completely with textuality. And for a goy thinking in abstract platon, platonic uh, terms, it's difficult to say, what does the Talmud care? Why it said this here, why it said that there? And how do we resolve that? They don't care. Like, just, just tell me the idea. What do you want to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, okay. But no, I was thinking like, you know, how Jdeda would, uh, like Jdeda yeah, yeah. would say, no, the I, Talmud, nobody knows Talmud. You right, know? right. No, the he way they study. Here, he was referring it to the Western world. Okay, I believe there's actually a, somebody recently told me about a, 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 a tool, you would probably know about this, a law, a tool for lawyers called Nexus something. No. Uh, which, which gives you a mash, it gives conclusions, Yeah. legal conclusions, and then it gives you the entire uh, dialogue leading up to the legal conclusion. It's like, a, it's like this database. Nice. I don't know yeah. if you've heard of it. I did, yeah, continue. Yeah. Um, okay. Another possible chapter Rhetoric transmission and tradition, if adequately developed, would produce a lot. Okay. Uh, another possible chapter. Interesting. <laughs> he could have written a chapter on rhetoric, transmission, and tradition. That would have been great. Rhetoric, mm -hmm. the derashot al hachamim, transmission, the masoret, uh, how it was, how the Torah uh, Shabbat was transmitted, and tradition. But I think he deals with that in horizontal society. In here, but. Right, if we'll adequately why he developed, doesn't. would produce a lopsided effect. But then it, what would happen then is there would be too much towards the rabbinic side and then it would exclude the Western world and he didn't want to do that. Therefore, and that's why I wrote a horizontal society. Therefore, as it were, the inner orbit of the silver dots will not be studied here because the inner orbit, of course, is tradition, transmission, and rhetoric. In other words, the existence of the silver dots is denoted here. And the importance right. of the uh, thing between ideality and articulation is also noted, right. but the actual articul the actual ideality isn't developed. Right, the actual Gemara and the actual right. So this is not a study of Gemara or a study of rabbinics. It would rather it's a study of comparative approaches to text and literary theory. It would be best to explore it in a separate work, which is again what he does in the horizontal society. So we finished yeah, the we introduction. Finished the Hakdama. The Hakdama. Hazak Baruch.